Hey there, welcome to SI Now. It is Thursday, October 27th, and I'm Maggie Gray. I'm sure it was a labor of love. Believe Land, the movie documenting Cleveland's torturous sports history, got a recut after the Cavaliers won the NBA title. Could yet another ending be in store for the movie makers? Well, Andy Billman directed the film. He's also a Cleveland native and was at Game 2 of the World Series. He joins me now. Uh, Andy, the series is tied one-to-one, -one, but obviously daunting task of playing the next three games in Chicago. How are the Indians fans feeling now? Um, I think I think some are, there's like half and half. Half are ready to jump off the bridge nervousness. It's not, they don't think that uh, the world's crumbling. And then the other half kind of like where I'm at right now, where it's like, I think everything's okay. Um, I, honestly, with the, Cavs, with the Cavs winning, it's taking some of the edge and pressure off us as Cleveland fans to win. We really want this World Series. We want it badly, but not as nervous as we probably once were. But I think the tone is, that, well, the Cubs are very, very good. So I think this is going to go six or seven games very, okay. very easily. How would you describe the Cubs fans that you've encountered? Do you feel any kinship with what they're going through? Um, I understand what they're going through, and um, I will. There's two sides. They're very confident, and I know. I and by the way, that's because they play on the field, but they're very nervous uh, because they they know this is a rare opportunity. They have not been to the World Series since '45. I don't want it since late. Everybody's been talking about this all last past week, so they're very nervous. But they're also. I was in Chicago, ironically, for Game One, watching it at a um, at a bar restaurant there. And they're very confident but nervous. And I know that nervous feeling because they just want to break this drought. So I would say it's a very unique group right now. Um, and they're definitely in bunches. If you go to Chicago this weekend, the water is blue. The letter of the month is W. I mean, it's everywhere in the city of Chicago. You know, despite earlier allegiances to the Yankees, LeBron James has been a supporter of the Indians. What effect has LeBron had on the tribe? Oh, a lot. I mean, I was at game two for the Boston series. And uh, when he did that, I actually thought the Red Sox had lost before they even stepped on the field because it was such high energy in that stadium. And it's been a lot of positive energy for the city of Cleveland, not just in sports, but off the field. And LeBron's been a big part of that. And when he did that, and so and just showing not just him but the whole team, and that should be really brought up. It hasn't just been LeBron. Like even last night, you saw um, I saw RJ, you saw Love, you saw other players last night at the game. And that's so cool, and it really kind of unites us as Clevelanders. It means a lot to Cleveland fans. It means a lot to me. I got to be honest, even though that sounds weird, it's true. And we just love that stuff. And yeah, well, LeBron did that. And the support LeBron, it just means the world to us. And that's why this whole trip has been great. And we, I really want the Indians to win, but this experience with the Indians has been great. A very, very cool experience again. Although you wouldn't say that the Indians are just happy to be here, right? No. No, we want this. I want a World Series, Maggie. I want a World Series, Allie's a fan. Um, it, this is a big, big thing. I've gone to a lot of Indians games as a kid. I want this bad. You know, I back really in do, back so. in June, Andy, we asked you about how the entire city of Cleveland has changed since the Cavaliers won the title. What would happen mm -hmm. if the Indians added a World Series title to that? Oh, you might have to put a heat check on Cleveland. Even though it's fall and winter, it might be, it might be 95 degrees here. Um, <laughs> it's really going to explode in positivity it's gonna i think in either case it still will be a great vibe but gosh the indians win holy cow the city will i just get the feeling i just get the feeling that were to happen you would see such a euphoric yelp again of positivity and energy sports means so much to the city and it's really it's really camaraderie and i'll tell you a big part of that too has been Terry francona he is a great manager for the city he's a wonderful manager overall anyways but we love him, and he really embraces Cleveland, and we embrace it back. Andy, I understand that the positivity would be through the roof if Cleveland was to win the World Series, but I have to ask about the flip side as well, and I'm curious to know how fragile is the psyche of a Cleveland sports fan if the Indians fail to win the World Series? Is it going to return to, oh, same old Cleveland? No. In fact, I'm glad you brought this up. I saw an article today. I won't name who or who wrote it, but they were talking about like these new curses of maybe um, Drone and Trevor Bauer. And I saw this from several writers. That stuff's dead. 
I mean, that stuff's gone. Um, look, we'll be very upset because we're very – every fan's competitive. I'm competitive. I really would love to win the World Series as an Indian fan. That would mean the world to me. It'd be great. However, because the Cavaliers won, i got to be honest with you, the edge in some circumstances what you're talking about is off. Um, it, it's funny. I saw a couple of people bring this up today in conversations and articles. I, I'll speak for maybe myself. I think most people are still the same way. All that stuff's gone. A lot of this stuff's kind of dead. Um, this is the new Cleveland. That's kind of old Cleveland. Now, the new Cleveland doesn't really get worked up into that stuff anymore. It is the dawn of a new day. Relaxation in Cleveland, although the series tied one to one. <laughs> Andy, thank you so much for lending your perspective on what the Cleveland fan is going through right now. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Go Tribe. Okay. My next guest is already a two-time Olympic gold medalist boxer and has just announced she is turning pro. Her debut will be on November 19th on the undercard of Sergey Kovalev, Andre Ward. It will lead off HBO's Freeview telecast at 7 p.m. Eastern. Clarissa Shields is here. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. You know, you turn pro and a, a whole new battle begins for you because you are going into a sport where there's not a lot of fanfare. Quite frankly, it would have been safer for you to try to go for another, a third gold medal, but now you're turning pro. Was there any apprehension about making that move? Um, of course it was. Um, I'm giving up as of right now. I can't go back to the Olympics for 2020, and that's something that I know is def that I can definitely uh, capable of, of, uh, of doing and that it will be pretty easy because I know boxing like the back of my hand, but now I'm always in the professionals and I'm going to something that I don't really know. I just know that I'm young and that um, I wanted to join the fight to help women uh, build a platform for women's boxing, so I decided to turn professional. How much pressure is on your shoulders about growing the sport, not just taking care of yourself and making a living, but <clears throat> making sure that the sport continues to go to a healthy place? There is a lot of weight on my shoulders, and it's not like this fight on November 19th <clears throat> is, is a big fight because if I don't do well, it's kind of like women's boxing don't progress. But when I do well, which I will, then we'll have, they're going to put more women on undercards and um, I'm going to have a lot more new fans and people are going to start respecting women's boxing just because of my skill and my power and the way that I box. So uh, it's a pretty big day for me on, on November 19th. Yeah, it's a huge day. But, you know, I think a lot of people would look from the outside and say, listen, you could do what Holly Holm did. You could start as a boxer. You could eventually go to mixed martial arts. That's a place where women are being given big fights, big contracts. They're able to make money. Is that something that's in your thought process? No, I'm doing it strictly for women's boxing. I've been boxing since I was 11 years old. I always thought, you know, no, no, no disrespect to the women MMA fighters because I'm really friends with a lot of them. But boxing, to me, is a better sport, and we've been around longer. And we've had a harder fight, and we've and we started this fight for for the respect of women a long, long time ago, before women's MMA was even thought about. So women's boxing has been has, has been around for a very long time, and it's time for us to get our just due. It's time for us to get some respect, and who else to do it than me? Then to you know, I think I'm a one in a century fighter, and that you only get one of me. And I think that right now, while I'm young and while I'm fresh and while I'm just coming off my win of two. Olympic gold medals, it's time to show the best of women's boxing. Are you worried about the, I guess, the opponents you could face? You don't even have an opponent for this November 19th fight, or unless I'm wrong about that, but is there a talented enough crop of women for you to fight to make that come true? Yes. Um, a lot of women are, who I know, have been scared to turn professional because of there isn't a platform. Um, I'm building that platform, so a lot of uh, younger girls and women will want to go pro, and uh, that's where we'll build that, uh, you know, fight scene and, and and make it easier for the matchmakers to get us fights. But but as of right now, it's hard for me to get a fight strictly because everybody knows how good I am. If I had two Olympic gold medals and I and I couldn't fight, I would get a fight easily. Yeah. But it's funny that you haven't yeah. even had a professional fight yet. Fighters are already ducking you and dodging you. Um, you've signed with Rock Nation for just this one fight, this one fight contract. Any boxer will tell you that um, management is a huge part of your career and, yes. and contributes a lot to your success or failure. Um, if you could map out your professional career, how do you want it to go? Um, I want to go my first, my first year being professional, I want to fight 10 times. 
Um, wow. So from November 19th to November 19th, I should have 10 professional 10 fights. 10 fights? Is that safe? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm an amateur and I fight 20. So 20 times a year, 15. So, uh, and I fight tournament style. This is you get ready for one opponent in a certain amount of rounds just for one day. And I've fought, you know, five, six times in one week to win and dominate a whole tournament. So I don't think 10 fights is really a lot, especially for my age and how young I am and how fresh I am. So I think that it's a, it's a pretty, it's a thing that can, uh, that can happen. I'm about my fights to have about maybe 40 fights in the next five years. Wow. Um, of course, I want to be fighting on HBO, Showtime, uh, fighting for millions of dollars, of course. But, you know, you always need that one rival who you have to build the fight up. And I don't know who it's going to be, but I know I have a couple enemies at my weight class who are, who are already in the pros right now. You say you want to make millions of dollars. Is that a reality? Is that happening right now? Are you being offered that kind of money? No, I wish. But... I'm not getting offered any chump change. This is definitely, they're definitely respectful. And I bring a huge draw to the, you know, Sergey and Kovalev fight. Yeah. Sergey and Ward fight, sorry. I bring a lot of attention to it. And I have a huge fan base and people want to see me fight. And that's what a lot of women fighters don't do. They don't, they don't build their brand to have a lot of fans. I'm like, uh, I'm in uh, high demand right now. So I... Um, I turned pro at a pretty good time, and I'm going to reap the benefits of it. Yeah, I would say coming off of two gold medals, this is definitely a time when you are in demand. Yeah. You know, boxing, it demands discipline and focus <clears throat> unlike any other sport. You've said this in the past, um, speaking of your hometown of Flint, Michigan. You've said you see people in Flint are used to seeing people be successful and then falling off. You've said Flint has limits. You had to leave Flint, Michigan. You're training in Florida right now. Mm -hmm. How important was that for you to get away from your hometown, which I'm sure was not easy, to get to where you are today? Well, you know what? <clears throat> One of my main reasons for leaving was, you know, God had talked to me and he told me that the, the things that I have for you, you're not going to be able to appreciate them being here because a lot of people in Flint don't, don't really don't really. Uh, appreciate the things that God gives to them as far as in their gift or their abilities or just their voice to speak. And uh, Flint was this small circle that, that they want you to stay, lo you know, stay locked in and don't really want you to experience the rest of the world. And um, as I started to experience the rest of the world, it's like I had this bigger vision for myself. And it's not that I wanted to leave Flint out, but it just was bigger than Flint. You know, I want to be able to help Flint, but I can't help Flint if I never make it out of Flint. So... Um, it actually started when we started feeling, I started feeling sad and, uh, and depressed back at home. So that's when I moved to the training center just to focus on the Olympics. And then after the Olympics was over, I thought about, you know, staying back at home. And then I went there and I was there for about two weeks. And I'm like, I, I can't be here. It's not that, it's not that the people are, we just, I just think too far up in the sky to be there where, where they don't really respect it. And it's like everywhere else I go. You know, of course, my hometown loves me, but I'm like I'm highly respected as a super, super dominant and great athlete. And it's like there's Flint is so used to me that they kind of forgot, I guess. So well, I'm sure they'll all be tuned <clears throat> in to watch you on November 19th. That's for sure. If you go to HBO on pay-per-view channel at 7 p.m. Eastern, you can watch your match for free. It's a big spot for you, though, Clarissa. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you for being here. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you guys for having me. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Despite his well-known love of stand-up comedy, Blake Griffin knows that last year, he was the punchline, pun intended. Now Blake is back, he's healthy, and embarking on the most important year of his career. For more on Blake, let's welcome in our very own Ben Golliver. Uh, ben, Blake's saying all the right things when it comes to basketball, but what is at stake for him this season? A lot. It's, hasn't it been a real story this opening week of these guys who've sort of been away from the game coming back with huge opening night performances, whether it's Anthony Davis, DeMar DeRozan, uh, after their playoff exit in Toronto. We've seen lots of stars have big opening nights, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if we see the same thing from Blake Griffin tonight against the Blazers. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, the punch was, the, was the, the storyline last year. He's coming back from that, and also a serious leg injury that cost him in the playoffs and also about more than half of his season. So he hasn't really been right health-wise since December. He spent all summer getting his body prepared, 
uh, you know, for this season. He came into camp in great shape, and I think he's just really, really hungry, not only to get back to playing basketball, which he does love, uh, but also to kind of rewrite his reputation. I think he took some you know, pretty serious beating last year in terms of public perception of him as a leader. He was fined by the organization uh, for his role in that fight. Uh, and then also his name came up in trade rumors as well. So I think this year is really going to be about trying to wipe the slate clean for Blake and getting back to that sort of MVP caliber player he was uh, as recently as like 2014. His reputation took a beating, so did an assistant equipment manager. Um, Blake's going to be a free agent this summer. How are the Clippers going to approach his future? I mean, this is going to be a huge season for them because it's not just Blake who can become a free agent next summer. There's Chris Paul who's in the same situation, and then J.J. Redick is going to be an unrestricted free agent. So they could look very different next season depending on how this year goes. I mean, one thing that Blake Griffin really tried to stress is that he's not looking at – uh, the big picture long-term view, right? He's not trying to think about things like championship windows and a five-year plan or anything like that. He's really focused on this season. And after the way last year went so unpredictably, you, you really can't blame him for having that short-term focus. Uh, but you look at the partnership between him and Chris Paul. I mean, are there questions there in terms of, uh, you know, are they best friends or are they sort of work friends, like, kind of like a Kevin Durant uh, and a Russell Westbrook were in Oklahoma City. Is that going to be a long-term partnership with Chris now over 30 and, and potentially headed for uh, age-related decline here in a couple of seasons? Uh, are they going to be able to kind of continue to coexist uh, when they can both choose where they want to play next summer? I think these are open questions, and nobody really knows how it's going to play out. Uh, the fact that he was in trade rumors last year, I'm not sure if he takes that personally or not, but when you're a big-time star like that, you don't like to hear that. Uh, and so we'll see where this all where this all goes. Ben, several big storylines came out of Philadelphia last night. It's been a while since we've been able to say that, but let's begin with the pregame controversy. Seventh Streeter, who was scheduled to sing the national anthem, was pulled from her performance. Here is her explanation as to why. I'm at the 76ers game to sing the national anthem, and the organization is telling me that I can't because I'm wearing a We Matter jersey. What? All right, we've seen players wear I Can't Breathe shirts in the past, Ben, with no ramifications. Is it hypocritical for the Sixers in the league to pull the anthem singer because of what she's wearing? They choked. I mean, there's no question about it. They weren't expecting this. They didn't want to have this quote-unquote distraction. They were so excited for their big night with Joel Embiid finally getting back on the court. And I'm sure that they were worried this was somehow going to overshadow or, or distract from what they had planned and, and carefully scripted. Because, you know, most basketball teams do kind of very carefully script their opening night uh, you know, activities for, from well before the, the game starts until the end of the game. So uh, I think they screwed that up. I think they definitely owe her an apology. I don't see how that could be sort of a controversial shirt in any way. Uh, I don't know. I mean, to me, they, they screwed it up. I mean, they just they probably weren't expecting it. They had to make a quick decision in a short amount of time, and I think they pretty clearly made the wrong decision. And we'll see how the league goes forward with this. Uh, it's too bad for her. She clearly in the video that you just played looked very disappointed, uh, and, and rightfully so. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the big night for Philadelphia, though, Joel Embiid and the process. Well, he's really nicknamed himself the process. He's been out for the last two years with injuries. He is our adrenaline performer, Ben, presented by Toyota. Let's go places. This all happened with his, well, 22 minutes and 20 points. What's the appropriate level of optimism for Embiid after just one game? Well, I think if you're him, you've got to be overjoyed and elated. I mean, you can kind of see it. He's talking trash on the court. He's back in the scheme of things. And I think he's been away from basketball so long that he kind of has adopted the mentality that he's got nothing to lose. Uh, and that's exactly how he should do it. I mean, I remember back to Greg Oden a few years ago uh, when he was in a similar situation. He had a tendency to kind of freeze up once he was back on the court. He felt like everybody was watching him and judging him because of the injuries, and he never quite looked as natural. And so you wondered, how is Embiid going to handle a similar situation? And he really went the other direction with it. He found his joy in the game. He looked very comfortable. His shot looks pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of things to take away positively if you're him, if you're their coaching staff, and if you're the fan base. Uh, but I'm really constantly urging caution with him. I mean, we're going to need to see him consistently stay healthy and play, you know, real minutes, not this 20 minutes limit that he's been on, you know, for at least a season, if not two, before I'm going to be convinced that these injury issues are behind him. So I think it's a great start 
uh, but I'm constantly kind of pumping the brakes on anyone who's got a history of either foot or knee issues as a big guy. Yeah, absolutely. Ben Golliver, really appreciate your time. Season's off to a great start. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Maggie. Time to check in on the world of soccer with our own Grant Wall. Grant, it's a huge storyline here in the U.S. that ratings for the NFL are down double digits. Well, they're also down for the Premier League 20 percent. Why is this happening? Well, this is happening over in England and over there it is pay television that is almost entirely showing the Premier League. So that may have something to do with it as cord cutting happens. Now, one explanation for here in the U.S. with the NFL is, well, it's election season sure. and people aren't watching sports as much. That's not the case over in the UK. So, you know, I'm just speculating here. I don't have all of the answers, but I think also there's a possibility that like the NFL, there just may be too much soccer available now in some ways. Too many games, too many time slots. The Premier League had added a Friday time slot this year. They have a Monday time slot. They have Saturday and Sunday. I recently talked to the uh, president of FC Barcelona, who actually was marveling at the NFL television deal and said they can get seven billion dollars for so few games and he mm. emphasized so few games maybe there's too much that's out there these days and it needs to be more of a special event a smaller size yeah the product getting watered down perhaps not seeming special to the viewers if this is not a blip on the radar if these trends continue what could the ripple effect be? Well, the new television contract went into place this year for the Premier League, and it's so huge because they had competition between different television mm. channels for that bid. And so right now, the lowest Premier League teams are wealthier than teams like AC Milan on the continent because so much television money has been coming in, gives a huge advantage to the Premier League teams. Now, obviously, these deals last for a few years, but if this ratings drop continues, that will hurt the Premier League teams on the market. Ben, it's fascinating. It really is. Uh, let's talk about what's going on on the pitch with the Premier League. Five teams are within one point of each other. Liverpool may be the most interesting out of that group. Can you explain why? Well, you've had uh, Jurgen Klopp came in last season with a lot of fanfare, and he's really starting to get the most out of this Liverpool team now that he's been able to have a preseason, bring his guys in. And his style, this high-pressing style, requires everyone on the field to buy into it. And it's not an easy way to play. It's very effective. But, you know, you had guys last year, maybe like Christian Benteke, who didn't fit that very well. Now you have Sadio Mane come in, and he's very good at – not just scoring goals, but all initiating the press to win the ball in the opposition. And I think Liverpool has a chance to win the league this year. How probable is that? What are they going to have to overcome? Well, I think it's just longevity and, and keeping up what they're doing. This is a very punishing style of play, and they're going to pick up some injuries. But, uh, you know, Klopp is a guy who's won the Bundesliga, took Dortmund to the Champions League final a few years ago. I think he's capable of getting the most possible out of this Liverpool team. He's already won over the players, and now he's winning over the fans at Liverpool who are really excited about this. Very interesting. Uh, let's go over to La Liga, Sevilla's new manager, Jorge Sampaoli. Well, he has his team in second place right now. What have we learned about the coach so far? Well, he's in his first season. Here's a guy who was the coach of Chile, had so much success with that team, and kind of a crazy start to the season because he almost left Sevilla before he even started the job to take the Argentine national team job, decides to stick around, had a contract, and Sevilla's a team that's won so many Europa League titles in recent years that they're sort of the king of the second tier over in Europe, but now they're challenging for the top of the Spanish league against Real Madrid. Very tight race. They just beat Atletico Madrid last weekend. And he's gotten players to come in, like Samir Nasri, who was let go by Manchester City, been fantastic uh, for Sevilla so far. And I think we're going to see a more competitive Spanish league race this year. It's not just going to be the two or three teams we typically see. That's great for the fans of Sevilla, for sure. Uh, let's go stateside now. MLS playoffs underway. Got to get your pick, Grant. Who's going to win it all this year? I'm going to go with Toronto FC, and they're the team I picked at the beginning of the year. They've always had this terrific team on paper, but have never really produced on the field when it counts in this league. But uh, they won their play-in game on Wednesday night against Philadelphia, first home or first playoff win in the team's history. So uh, I think they have what it takes now that they've really bolstered the defensive side, which is always a big problem for Toronto. Very interesting matchup coming up now against NYCFC in Toronto. 
uh, in the next round. I think they'll get by NYCFC. Uh, and I think they'll get by the New York Red Bulls, who are kind of the hottest team in the league with a 16-game unbeaten streak right now. But it's wide open. It's MLS playoffs. Anything can happen. What about Dallas? They have a chance for a domestic treble. I love that. The U.S. Open Cup, MLS Supporters Shield, and I don't know, could an MLS title be the be the finisher? It's certainly possible. It's going to be a little bit harder, I think, to win this because they've lost Mario Diaz, their playmaker, to a torn Achilles, and that's just a crushing blow. They don't really have anyone to replace him. Fabian Castillo had already left. Uh, but this team under Oscar Pereja has found a way all season to get the results they need. There's some great chemistry there. So I'm not going to write off Dallas. And if they can achieve this, this treble, which is winning three trophies in the same season, it would be something we haven't seen in the history of MLS. We're going to keep our eyes on that. Grant Wall, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. That's going to do it for this Thursday edition of SI Now. Tomorrow, Houston Texans wide receiver Jalen Strong will join the show. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern. But until then, you can keep up with all the latest sports news on SI.com and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SI Now Live. Have a fantastic day. We'll see you tomorrow.